uh, orientable maps and polynomial invariants of free bicyclic groups. All right, well, thanks for the invitation to speak. Hopefully it was me who you intended to invite. Um, yeah, so, but I'm gonna be speaking about joint work with Spencer and also Radhika Gupta. Um, so we could get started. So um, I think it's a pretty basic set of questions that we'll be interested in. So we'll get started just introducing the questions. Okay, so for this talk, um, we're going to be interested uh, ex pretty much exclusively um, in fully irreducible uh, outer automorphisms. So let's fix a free group of rank at least two. And recall that in uh, fully irreducible outer automorphism is one um, for which no power of it fixes uh, the conjugacy class of any non-trivial proper free factor of the free group. Okay, so that's sort of our, our class of outer automorphisms we're interested in. Um, if you're more familiar with mapping class groups, this is the analog in, in the setting we're interested in, uh, in Pseudo-Anasovs. And, and we're gonna see throughout that there's gonna be a, a inspiration, a lot of inspiration coming from the situation of mapping class groups and fibered three manifolds. Um, so if you're more familiar with that, it's, uh, it's good to think about. Okay, so anyway, uh, an arbitrary outer automorphism determines the following objects. Okay, so any outer automorphism has an associated stretch factor, what we'll call the geometric stretch factor, and it has this simple definition. So what do you do? You fix the conjugacy class alpha. So here alpha is a conjugacy class. And you iterate alpha under powers of the automorphism. And you look at the growth with respect to any fixed norm on conjugacy classes. So that's what we're doing there. And we're essentially looking at the exponential growth rate of that sequence of numbers. So the exponential growth rate of conjugacy classes iterating the under iterating the, the automorphism okay and then in general we would take the supremum over all conjugacy classes so let's call that the geometric stretch factor of the automorphism so that's one quantity we'll be interested in uh, the other quantity could be called the homological stretch factor uh, simply you look at the action of the outer automorphism on the first homology of the free group and you take the spectral radius so of course if you fix a basis of the free group, the first homology um, you know, becomes z to the n, for instance, and then the induced map on h1 is just some matrix, and we're taking the spectral radius, so the modulus of the largest eigenvalue. Okay. Um, so those are the two quantities we'll be interested in throughout the talk, the geometric stretch factor and the homological stretch factor. Of course, I could have actually defined these in a symmetric way. I could have defined the homological stretch factor to be the same sort of thing where I look at growth rates um, with respect to phi's action on homology, um, where alpha now is a, is a vector in the, in the first homology group. Okay. So these are the two quantities we'll be interested in. And to give more structure to our discussion, um, we'll also be interested in the associated free bicyclic group. Um, so when I form the free bicyclic group, the semi direct product um, using the automorphism phi, here, I guess this should be uh, automorphism in the rep that represents phi. When I form that free bicyclic group gamma that I'll, I'll be talking about throughout the class, uh, throughout the class, throughout the, um, the talk, uh, it'll always come with a, a dual class eta. So eta is just the homomorphism, which I'll think of as an element of H1 that corresponds to projection to the second factor. Okay. So this is, these are sort of the objects that will be of interest. And as I said before, a lot of our inspiration is going to come from the three manifold setting. And just to say it, um, since we're assuming phi is fully irreducible and we will throw out, either the free bicyclic group gamma is a Gromov hyperbolic group, or it's the fundamental group of the three manifold. It's a fundamental group of the corresponding uh, once punctured surface bundle over a circle. Okay, so the, that note, I guess that's combining some of the results of Vesfina Fane and Vesfina Handel. Okay, but this is sort of, this is what we're interested in. And the first question, I think it's a very simple question that one could ask is, okay, so we have this fully irreducible, when does the geometric stretch factor equal the homological stretch factor? It's what I think is a fairly basic question. Um, so we'll get to this, but I wanna sort of put more structure around this question. Um, so, so let's do that. I could think of the, stretch factors not really being its functions of the automorphism, but of being functions of the cohomology class. And, and the reason I wanna do that is because I could sort of vary the cohomology class, I could vary the, um, 
the map to Z. When I vary the map to Z, I get nearby splittings of my group into free bicyclic groups. And I can see how the stretch factor and the homological stretch factor vary. So I want to say a slightly more rigorous version of that uh, using work of Dal Dal Kapovich and Leininger. And I'll, I'll be even more rigorous later in the talk. Um, but just to say something rigorous right now. So I have this cohomology class eta, which is a map to Z. Uh, it's a fact that for nearby cohomology classes, A to prime, they themselves are dual to different splittings of the free bicyclic group uh, into, into um, a distinct way of splitting it as a free bicyclic group. And here, when you split it differently as a free bicyclic group, you have a different outer automorphism psi. And I could consider its geometric stretch factor. And so in this way, I could consider like the geometric, stre geometric stretch factor of nearby uh, cohomology classes. And, and the same for uh, algebraic stretch factors. And so a more um, structural question is what happens when I vary the vibration? So if I have this agreement of algebraic stretch factor and geometric stretch factor at a single cohomology class, does that mean these functions, these stretch factor functions agree for nearby splitting? Okay. Um, I think this answer, this question is gonna have a somewhat subtle answer um, about the cases when it does imply that they agree and, and a separate case when, when they don't. So we'll see that throughout the talk. Um, and then to add even more structure to the question, this function that evaluates the homological stretch factor is really governed by the classical Alexander polynomial of the free bicyclic group. Uh, similarly, the geometric stretch factor is governed by what's called the McMullen polynomial, which was a polynomial um, introduced by Daldal Kapovich Leininger. Um, so really these two functions we're interested in, these two stretch factors, homological and geometric, are governed by polynomial invariants of the group. And maybe the question with the most structure is, is there some relationship between these polynomial invariants? So is there a polynomial and um, a relationship between the classical Alexander polynomial, so you've seen Alexander polynomial in the context of link complements, it's the same object, and this McMullen polynomial that governs the geometric, geometric stretch factors. Okay, so that's, those are the questions that motivate the talk and we'll, we're gonna backtrack and um, cover these objects in more detail, but that's really just where we're going. Um, I think it's, it's motivated by a simple question about the relationship between this algebraic and the geometric stretch factor. And we'll see uh, as we go along the, where the motivation for the three manifold setting fits in. Okay. Uh, Great, so let's, let's, unless there are any questions, let's start with this first question, just the automorphism wise question. We fix an automorphism, can we tell when the two stretch factors are gonna be equal? Okay, so let's see where the, you know, we're gonna get our inspiration from the mapping class group case. Uh, so recall that an, autom um, an outer automorphism is geometric if, um, it's induced by a pseudo Nassov homeomorphism of a once punctured surface. Um, so what I mean by that is I have a surface, a once punctured surface S, its fundamental group is some free group and a homeomorphism of the surface induces an outer automorphism. So we'll call the fully reducible geometric when it comes from this um, homeomorphism of the surface. Okay, so in this case, this question has been answered. So recall one of these pseudo Nassov homeomorphisms comes with the structure of two invariant foliations. Okay, so the, the homeomorphism of the surface that induces our, our automorphism has two invariant foliations. And combining some work of Thurston and, and Dan Boylan, sort of going back to the Thurston's really introduction of pseudo Nassovs, um, it was known that the geometric stretch factor equals the homological stretch factor if and only if the, uh, either one of the foliations is, is orientable, transversely orientable. Okay, so in the mapping classical world, in the case of surface homeomorphisms, there's this fairly simple um, answer to the question of when the two stretch factors agree. It's when the foliation that sort of comes with the pseudonasov is orientable. Okay, and in one direction, 
uh, Thurston just notes that in this, the case where, say, this unstable foliation is orientable, um, then the um, so the, the, the foliation itself can be thought of as like the integral curves of uh, a one form, and that one form is the eigenvector for the action on first Durham cohomology. Okay, that, so that that's the direction that orientable foliation implies equality of the two numbers. Okay, so just the real this motivation here sort of directs us to try to understand what this orientability is for a, an outer automorphism. And, and our answer is, is maybe what anyone would hope would be with the answer. So it's pretty direct. So let's let F be a graph map. Uh, let's define some corresponding objects. So instead of having an, an automorphism now, let's just fix a, a map from a graph to itself, a continuous map that sends vertices to vertices. So the geometric, geometric stretch factor of a graph map, so we'll denote it the same way, is simply the spectral radius of the uh, transition matrix. So by transition matrix here, I just mean the absolute simplest thing. There's an entry of the transition matrix for each pair of edges, and I'm just recording the number of times that one edge gets mapped over another edge um, with either orientation. Okay, so just that positive integer matrix that records how many times one edge gets wrapped over another edge. Okay, so the spectral radius of that we'll call the geometric stretch factor. So just as before, you know, we have this um, F acts on the first homology of the graph and we can define the homological stretch factor to be the spectral radius of that, of that matrix. One more definition, uh, or maybe second to last definition, an orientation on G is simply a, a choice of orientation for each edge of G. And now we can define what it means for a graph map to be orientable. So we'll say a graph map is orientable if there exists a choice of orientation so that each edge is mapped to a positive edge path. That is the image of each positive edge uh, consists only of positive edges in the target. So that's what it means to be orientable. We'll also define an anti-orientable graph map. And that's where each positive edge maps over a negative edge path as it traverses each edge in the negative direction. Good. Any questions about these definitions? I mean, they're not too technical. Okay. So let's just observe like the most basic things. Here are the most basic observations one can make. Uh, so let's let M denote F's actional one chains, the usual actional one chains. Um, so then just we'll note, if F is orientable, then the action on one chains, the matrix representing the action on one chains, I should say M is the matrix representing the action on one chains, is equal to the transition matrix, right? Because each edge goes over only positive edges. So as matrices, they are equal, okay? And similarly, if it's anti-orientable, then the transition matrix is exactly the negative of the map on um, one chains. Uh, simplicial one chains, one chains formed by edges. Okay, so this immediately tells us that in the orientable case or the anti-orientable case, the geometric stretch factor equals the homological stretch factor because the matrices are the same. Okay, up to sign, and it actually tells us a little bit more in the orientable case. Yeah, the stretch factor is actually um, an eigenvalue of the action on homology, and in the anti-orientable case, minus the stretch factor is an eigenvalue. Okay. But in either case, we see that here's like very easy, sufficient conditions to get the um, geometric stretch factor equal to the homological stretch factor. It's just orientability or anti-orientability. Uh, similarly, with a little bit more reasoning, you could show the situation I'm sure most of you observed already, that the homological stretch factor is always less than or equal to the geometric stretch factor. Okay, so the first uh, main theorem is the essentially the converse of the simple observation um, with, with a hypothesis. So suppose, I think I said this is all joint work with Spencer Dalval and Radhika Gupta. Um, right, so suppose you have a graph map, uh, what we call a primitive graph map. So that means it's a graph map and then some power of the adjacency matrix is positive. So that means it's positive 
uh, all of its entries are positive. Then the homological stretch factor equals the algebraic stretch factor if and only if the map is either orientable or anti-orientable. Okay, so it's just the, the converse of the first bullet point. And so this is meant to be like just our straightforward, simple criteria for when one of these graph maps has a homological stretch factor equal to its um, geometric stretch factor. And it's exactly this being able to orient the graph so that edges are either mapped to positive edge paths or map to negative edge paths. And I'm just going to record this thing that I said before that um, you could further refine it and say that the stretch factor is actually an eigenvalue of the induced map on homology if and only if the graph map is orientable. So that distinguishes the orientable from the anti orientable case. Okay. Um, so, you know, our original question is about. Outer automorphisms, we sort of answered it for these special types of graph maps. But it, you know, if you've thought about uh, fully reducible outer automorphisms before, then you'll see we basically have answered the, the original question we were interested in. So let's just sort of put that together. Um, so recall, so you know, we'll say that a graph map represents an outer automorphism if you know once we identify the fundamental group of the graph with the, the free group of the desired rank. Um, up to conjug conjugation, the F induces um, phi at the level of pi one. So that's what it means to represent phi. So here's our answer. So a fully reducible, so let's fix a fully reducible. Then the homological stretch factor equals the algebraic stretch factor if and only if um, you know, the, the following things are equivalent. So phi has either an orientable or an anti-orientable graph map representative. So just a graph map that represents phi that is either orientable or anti-orientable. Um, that's equivalent to requiring every train track representative to be orientable or anti-orientable. So I'll remind you what that is in a moment. And then maybe this last item is just for experts, um, but it ties nicest to the, the um, analogy to surface groups. For the two stretch factors to be equal, it's the same for the expanding lamination of phi to itself be orientable. In sort of the, the obvious sense, you would define it. Um, okay, so just to clean up some definitions for a second, I'll just recall that uh, a train track map is one for which, if you take an edge and you iterate it under positive powers of the autom of the graph map, uh, you get a non-backtracking edge path. So you iterate the edge; it always is a um, edge path that doesn't backtrack. And when that happens, it's it, one can see directly that the stretch factor of the graph map representative equals the stretch factor of um, the outer automorphism. So that's what ties the previous two theorems together. And then I'll just make one simple observation that any orientable or anti-orientable um, map, it's a mouthful, map is automatically a train track representative. Why? Because if you start iterating an edge and you see backtracking, that means you cross an edge with both orientations, which is not allowed in either the orientable or the anti-orientable case. So somehow already built into the definition of um, one of these orientable maps is that it's a, it's a train track. Cool, so that's our first question. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but really the... Um, the, the rest of the rest of the talk is sort of answering this more these more structural questions about um, you know, splittings of the free bicyclic groups and when the equality of stretch factors persists. Oh, oh, there's an example. Here, let's let's see some examples. Um, I think I think these are kind of interesting examples to play around with. Uh, kind of. Okay, so G is this graph. So here's a graph we found. And here are just some assignments that determine a graph map. Okay. And we could, so just for us, you know, capital letters always denote lowercase letters, the, the same edges with the opposite orientation. So whatever I'm defining here is clearly an anti orientable graph map. And then one can check directly that that anti orientable graph map represents, um, well, it represents an automorphism. So it represents an outer automorphism of the corresponding free group, which in this case has rank five. And one can further check that it, it does indeed represent a fully irreducible outer automorphism. So here is an example 
of a fully irreducible uh, anti-orientable outer box. Okay, so I like this example. Let me say why. Anytime you give me a fully irreducible outer automorphism, there's four numbers that we've now introduced. Right? There's the stretch factor, there's the homological stretch factor, and then the inverse um, outer automorphism similarly has a stretch factor and a homological stretch factor. So there are four numbers. And in general, there's just like no reason that they should be related other than the obvious relations that we've already discussed. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting to just say when are some of them related. So let's just see in this example we just gave, it happens to be the case that all four numbers are equal. Um, we checked it, right? That's, you just check it. Um, and in this case, the inverse is also anti-orientable. So when we first started doing this, uh, Radhika, Spencer, and I, I, we guessed like, oh, if four number, if the four numbers are equal, then it should come from a surface, right? We know if you know, you're in the case of a surface, then of course the stretch factor equals the stretch factor of the inverse. That's part of the structure, and the homological stretch factor equals the homological stretch factor of the inverse. That's because you have a the action on homologies. Of, symplectic matrix and there's an intersection form you preserve. There's more structure there. Um, so a neat, naive conjecture might be when all these four numbers are equal, it comes from a pseudo Nasov on a once punctured surface with a orientable foliation. Um, so, but that's not the case. So in this case, this automorphism is not geometric. It doesn't come from a surface. Um, so depending how far I get with, with the slides, uh, I'll show you a calculation that establishes that using the Alexander polynomial. Um, so, but this yeah. few one, is it fully reducible at least? Yeah, yeah, it's fully reducible. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, right there, it's fully reducible. That's the same fee one, it's that one right there. Uh, so, 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 uh, okay, I mean, I believe it, but it's sort of not entirely obvious from this picture that this few one is- Oh good. yeah, I checked it. Or, or, or maybe Radhika Radic checked it. <laughs> it's it's oh, true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting example. Here's another interesting example. Uh, here is the outer automorphism of rank, in the rank three for experts, it's parageometric. Um, Anyway, it's an automorphism of Frank three. I wrote it there. We wrote it in terms of the basis ABC. It happens to be orientable. It's, it's not orientable in a rose. You see it's not a positive automorphism, but in this case it's orientable. So it's stretch factor equals its homological stretch factor. But then when you take the inverses, the stretch factor drops of the inverse drops below the original stretch factor and the inverse is not orientable nor anti-orientable. And so the homological stretch factor of the inverse is strictly less than the stretch factor. Of the inverse. It's just a, rela a different relation between the three numbers. Um, yeah, I, I think there's lots. Of, I think there's like, you look at the data, there's interesting examples. Um, I don't know if I have anything more structural to say about it. Um, am I right in thinking that if you, if you square an anti-orientable one, you get an orientable one? Definitely. So is there like something special about those? I mean, can you just tell whether an oriental one comes from the square of an anti-oriental one? I, I had not thought about whether you can tell whether an anti or whether an orientable one comes from the square of an anti-orientable one. Um, Yeah, it doesn't sound like an easy question to me. I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> all right, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Now I want to think about it, but I have to continue to talk. Cool. Oh, we could maybe if we get to the end of the talk, we'll see some more examples at the end. Okay. But now I want to like add more structure to the picture, which I think. Um, yeah. Okay, so the motivation here comes from the Thurston, Freed, McMullen, fibered face theory. Um, I just want to give like a real top level summary of the kind of objects we use. Really, we the corresponding theory that we'll use was developed uh, in this Daldal Kaplovich line. I'll probably stop saying that. I'll say DKL, but it's it's easier to explain the, 
the, the three manifold case. Okay, so let's let S, here's the, here's the motivation. So let's let S be a pseudo Anasov homeomorphism. And I'm gonna form the mapping torus, which means I take the surface, I cross it with an interval, and then I glue the top to the bottom by my fixed homeomorphism. And just like before, when I build a manifold this way, it comes with a cohomology class. The cohomology class just being there's the, there's when I build a manifold this way, there's a map to a circle. And I'm just taking the um, the pullback of the fundamental class of the circle. Or I mean, it's a fancy way of saying I'm just you know looking at the corresponding map to Z that I see from the picture. Okay. So part of the fibered face theory says the following thing. It says there is an open cone in first cohomology with real coefficients, that vector space. So that vector space of first cohomology has an open cone that contains my dual class, A to sub S. A, oh, I should have said, better way of thinking about A to sub S. A to sub S is the Poincaré dual of S. So S naturally lives in this manifold as a you know, oriented surface and the Poincaré dual is it's A to sub S. And so um, that's why in my cone there, I have S in brackets. I'm thinking of, I'm, I'm identifying, I'm using Poincaré duality, I'm identifying the surface with this Poincaré dual. Um, so I have this, so there's an open cone in the first cohomology that contains A to S in my picture, that's S in brackets. Call, it's called a fibered cone. It has the property that every other primitive integral class in that cone, so every other class in that cone that um, is in H upper one with Z coefficients and is not itself a power, is itself dual to a different fiber um, in a vibration of the manifold over a circle. So a different integral point is that T in brackets, and that T represents a different uh, a fiber of a different vibration. So that vibration comes with its own structure, right? Any way the manifold fibers over the circle, um, it's a that fiber um, comes with its own monodromy map, which is some pseudo Nasov homeomorphism. And that different monodromy map has its own stretch factor. Okay. So what I get is a stretch factor function for every primitive integral class in the cone alpha. I could look at the stretch factor lambda of the associated pseudo NASA. Hopefully that makes sense. I kind of said it very quickly. Um, the point is every prim every integral point in that cone, I could talk about its stretch factor right? because it corresponds to a way of representing that same manifold as a, a um, a surface bundle over the circle with a different monodromy. So I could talk about its stretch factor. So I get a stretch factor function and it extends to a continuous function on that cone. Okay, how do we understand that stretch factor? So one way we understand that stretch factor function is using work of McMullen. He introduced this object called the Teichmuller polynomial. So let me just in broad strokes tell you, I'm not gonna tell you what it is, I'm gonna tell you what it does. So hopefully that's somewhat satisfying. Um, so let H, be the first homology of the manifold modulo torsion. Here's what McMullen does. He associates to the fibered cone a polynomial invariant of the cone. So if you've seen the construction of the Alexander polynomial before, it's a similar construction using the dynamics of a lamination rather than just homology. Um, but what you get, you get an element in the, of the integral group ring of H. So H, for us, H is the homology, the first homology, and you get an element of the integral group ring of, of that homology, which he calls the Teichmuller polynomial. And I'm just reminding you here what that looks like, right? It's a you know, formal linear combination um, of elements of H with integer coefficients, so finite sum. Okay, so I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but here's what it does. So first of all, given any, cohomology, given any map from the homology to Z, there's just a, a way of turning this multivariable polynomial, it, I mean, element of the group ring into a single variable polynomial via what McMullen calls specialization. And there's a formula for it right there. Uh, don't wanna dwell on the formula. I'm just gonna say it turns this polynomial into a single variable polynomial. And so why is it interesting for us? McMullen proves that the, once you specialize, so if you take a, one of these integral classes alpha, and then you specialize at alpha, you get a single variable polynomial, a, a single variable Laurent polynomial. Um, the stretch factor that we're interested in is the largest root of that polynomial. Okay, so that's like the key point. The polynomial, when you pair it with a cohomology class, the largest root tells you the stretch factor. 
of the associated monodromy. And moreover, he shows that the, um, the Teichmuller polynomial determines the cone itself. Okay, so these are things that McMullen did to get a handle on stretch factors. In that same paper, paper he proves the following. So let's go back to this case where the Pseudonosov has a transversely orientable foliation. Okay, that's exactly the case where the stretch factor equals the homological stretch factor from several slides ago. He proves that in this case, if F preserves the orientation on the foliation, then the same holds for every monodromy in the cone. This is to say in the surface case, um, if you have an orientable monodromy, then everything in the cone is also orientable. And moreover, he proves that in this case, the Alexander polynomial, the classical Alexander polynomial of the three manifold divides the type Miller polynomial. So this is like the relation between the two polynomials in the three manifold case. Actually, since then, or quite recently, so McMullen's papers from around 2000, um, just within the last year, Anna Parlak um, determined the precise relationship between the two polynomials. Um, so not only does one polynomial divide the other, but you can sort of characterize what the quotient is. Um, and this is an alternative way of saying that over the entire cone, homo homological stretch factor equals geometric stretch factor. Okay. So this is the type of investigation we're interested in um, when we talk about different splittings of free by sigma groups. So let's kind of circle back to that. Um, unless there are questions about this general picture for three manifolds that I so quickly went through. Um, the upshot is, you know, there's this polynomial that tells you about the stretch factors, it's the, it's the Teichmuller polynomial. And then there's a classical polynomial that tells you about homological stretch factors, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. Um, it's the Alexander polynomial. And in the case you have this orientable lamination, there is, there is a relationship between the two. So McMullen proved that the Alexander polynomial divides the Teichmuller polynomial. And then more recent work of Parlak gives a precise relationship. So let's um, now sort of move to the uh, free by cyclic case. So very similar setup. So now I have a, instead of having a homeomorphism, I'm just gonna assume I have a graph map. And for the moment, let's assume nothing about a graph map. Let's assume it's just a continuous map from the graph to itself that sends vertices to vertices, okay? So just as before I could build the mapping torus, uh, and just as before, when I build the mapping torus, I get a corresponding map to Z. Um, and writing the mapping torus this way allows you to, you know, write the fundamental group in a specific form that um, DKL call a generalized H and an extension. So we have not assumed anything about our graph map. If the graph maps induced homomorphism on pi one was injective, then the fundamental group would split as a usual H and an extension. But because we haven't assumed that the map is injective, the map on the fundamental group is injective, it's not an HNN extension in the traditional sense, but it has the following presentation. So that's all that I mean by general generalized HNN extension. It's the fundamental group can be written in that way, you, that relative presentation. Um, and just as before, we have this dual class, which is the corresponding map to Z. And just with respect to this presentation, the map to Z has that obvious form. It sends the stable letter they are appearing as R to one and every um, element of the fundamental group of the graph to zero. Okay, so that's the corresponding structure we talked about before, just with more notation. Okay, so let's talk about, so um, you know, if you've thought about knots or links in the three series, you're familiar with the Alexander polynomial. Uh, similarly, any um, finally presented group has an Alexander polynomial. Okay, so in particular, the free by cyclic group that we're interested in has an Alexander polynomial. So let's just talk about how we can get at that, that polynomial invariant. So just as before, let's let H be the first homology of our mapping torus mod torsion, the first homology of gamma mod torsion. Um, so the Alexander polynomial is, as it's traditionally defined, is an element of the integral group ring of H um, and all the polynomials that appear in this talk are only defined up to a unit. 
So anytime I write down an equation, any equations only defined up to a unit, probably and have already probably forgotten to say that. But all polynomials, um, all elements of these group rings are defined up to a unit. Now, if you're familiar just with the Alexander polynomial from not theory, then you know that you could always efficiently calculate it in terms of Fox calculus. And that's true for any finally presented group. Given a presentation, you could officially compute the um, Alexander polynomial using Fox calculus in exactly the same um, method that it was originally designed to do for, for knots and links. Um, but for us, that's not going to be good. So for us, what we need to do is we need to have a computation of the Alexander polynomial that follows directly, that just uses the properties of the map F using F's um, action on homology. So that's going to be our goal. Our, our intermediate goal before we, we try to relate the two polynomials is just going to have a straightforward calculation of the Alexander polynomial, the classical Alexander polynomial, just in terms of the graph map F. Okay. So this is um, one contribution of this paper. Um, so take X. So let's let X tilde be the universal free abelian cover. So that's the cover of X whose deck group is H. And we're going to take the pre-image. So the pre-image of the initial graph, the graph we use to build the mapping torus, um, will be disconnected. And we're going to fix some component of the pre-image of that graph. And we'll call that G tilde naught. Okay. So G tilde naught, some connected cover of the graph. And you know, checking the details, we could see that the original graph map lifts to that cover. Okay, so we're going to make a choice and we're going to fix a lift. So fix your favorite lift of this particular cover. I think later on, I'll show you an example. I mean, I don't know if the example will be helpful, but we'll see the sort of all the objects in action. Okay, the point is, like, just to reiterate, we go to the universal free abelian cover of the mapping torus and we fix a component of the pre image of the graph and we lift the graph map to that component. Okay, so once we do that, we just get some extra structure. We, we've pinned down a couple of choices. Um, so first of all, let's let K denote the homology of the mapping torus that comes from the graph. Okay, so the homology of the mapping torus via some you know, easy exercise splits as the homology coming from the graph, we call that K, plus a cyclic factor. Okay, and this choice of the, um, lift of f to the this particular cover of the graph determines for us uh, that splitting of homology a particular a particular splitting of homology it determines for us a complementary factor of k okay, so here this is just the it's a i'm just writing down the obvious splitting that the fundamental group of the homology of the mapping to our splits as the homology coming from the graph and then some complementary factor okay so similarly f tilde has an action on one chains and zero chains. So F tilde, the lift of F, um, acts on one chains and zero chains of this graph. But there's extra structure there. The one chains and the zero chains have a natural action of K. So K is the deck group for uh, G tilde over G. And so the one chains and the zero chains have the structure of a ZK module. And so I could write down the action of F uh, as matrices with entries in ZK that record their action on that ZK module. So I, I realize as I'm saying, it's a lot to say. The point is like, you know, downstairs F acted on one chain and zero chains, vertices and edges, and there was a matrix for both. And now when you lift it to this cover, it's still a matrix, but it's a matrix with entries uh, in this group ring uh, because um, uh, the zero chains and one chains are ZK modules. Hopefully I didn't lose anyone with that slide. The point is, you know, from that data, there's an easy determinant formula for the Alexander polynomial. Okay, and I'll show you this later. I guess I mean there's an example later on. So let F be a graph map, so no other conditions, whose mapping torus is X and the fundamental group of the mapping torus is gamma. Um, then just just assume that the rank of the homology uh, is at least two. Otherwise, you have to modify the formula a little bit. Um, then the Alexander polynomial, the, Alexander, the classical Alexander polynomial is a ratio of two determinants. 
Um, the numerator there looks like the characteristic polynomial of the action on one chains in the cover, and the denominator looks like the characteristic polynomial of the action on zero chains in the cover. Uh, just to remind you, that's what M and P were. They were the ZK valued matrices for one chains and zero chains. So if you're familiar with um, McMullen's work on the Teichmiller polynomial, uh, this formula is very much inspired by a formula he writes down for the Teichmiller polynomial, and he calls it a determinant formula. So we also call this a determinant um, formula um, for the Alexander polynomial. Um, just as like a thing to say, if you've done these computations before, um, if the graph has a single vertex, that is, if the graph is a rose, um, Sam, I think you're breaking up. Uh -uh. Please tell me. Uh, Sam, can you hear me? Um, this is what happens with Zoom sometimes. Uh, Sam, hello. Shall we just give him a minute and see if he can? Uh, yeah, I think he's trying to reconnect. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, it's, um, it's the analog of rebooting the computer, but hopefully in this case it will be faster. <laughs> so, yeah, there he is. <laughs> he's back, but he's still on mute. Uh, uh, so I'm on a, I'm on a different internet connection now. How do I sound now? Uh, it's good, right? So at some point you started breaking uh, breaking up and uh, yeah, and then you disappeared. <laughs> we we could try again. We could try again. Can you see the slides? Uh, yeah, it's good now. Okay. Uh, formula for the Alexander polynomial. Okay. So where M and P are matrices with entries in uh, this integral group room. Okay, so I'm happy to answer questions, but I imagine you know, that it's just a formula. Um, the formula will allow us to just sort of directly relate Alexander polynomial to the McMullen polynomial. Um, so let's, let's sort of forge ahead and see that. Oh, maybe one thing just to quickly note, I, I think this wouldn't be, won't be a surprise for anyone who's thought about Alexander polynomials before. But I mentioned previously how the Alexander polynomial controls the homological stretch factor. Um, so I just added the precise formula for the sense in which the homological stretch factors are all controlled. So the left-hand side of that formula, the displayed equation, is essentially the characteristic polynomial of the original map F's um, action on homology. So by definition, you know, the largest root of that is the homological stretch factor. And the right-hand side is the specialization of the Alexander polynomial. Um, so I don't want to dwell on it, but the displayed equation, which is, follows directly from the main theorem, tells you that the specializations of the Alexander polynomial control give you the homological stretch factor, which I think if you are, you're familiar with Alexander polynomials is not, um, not a surprising fact. Okay, so now, you know, I mentioned this McMullen polynomial that comes from work of Dowdall, Kapovich, Leininger that I'm going to refer to as DKL. Let's kind of summarize enough of that to um, give the, the the main point, right? With we're using sort of McMullen's work on the Tyke Miller polynomial as sort of the, the mental model for what should be happening. Okay, so given a mapping torus coming from one of these, uh, coming from a train track map now, now we need to consider one of these train track maps. Um, DKL fancy that up a little bit to produce what they call a folded mapping torus, which is a related object that the, all we'll need to know comes equipped with some a semi-flow, okay? uh, similar to sort of the upward semi-flow in the mapping torus. Um, and so just like in the three manifold setting, they prove that um, this structure determines for you the following data. So first it determines an open cone. Um, so I'm calling it here C sub M, M will appear in a second. 
um, an open cone containing the dual class, a class we started with. And for the experts who um, are interested, they show that this cone agrees with a component of the BNS invariant, or I guess technically it, it's a cone on a component of the BNS invariant. So it's some kind of canonical cone. Um, and they also produce a polynomial invariant, uh, what they call the McMullen polynomial, which computes determined stretch factors in sort of exactly the same way we saw for the Teichmuller polynomial specializations of it um, at these classes, the largest roots of those single variable polynomials are the stretch factors. Okay. So now we have two polynomials. These are the, the objects we ultimately wanted to relate. We have the Alexander polynomial coming to us from this determinant formula. We have the McMullen polynomial, which I obviously didn't give any details of, but it's inspired by the Teichmuller polynomial and indeed captures the same data. In order to relate the two, I need to define one more polynomial. But this one's easy. So we call this the vertex polynomial. Uh, it just has a simple, simple definition. So in this folded mapping torus, there's um, closed orbits, closed orbits of the semi-flow, and a finite number of closed orbits of the semi-flow go through vertices. So I'm going to look at these finitely many closed orbits of the semi-flow that go through vertices. And I'm going to call those elements ZI. I'm going to think about them as elements of homology. Okay, so that elements, the ZI come from closed orbits of the semi-flow through vertices. And then I'm going to construct this polynomial, this element of the group ring. I'm just going to product together those finitely many things, or one minus ZI. I'm going to product them together over I. Okay, so that's just an object. That's an object in the group ring. Um, obviously, I haven't given you any intuition for why that's an important object. But uh, here's the theorem. So suppose I have one of these primitive train track map, maps um, that induces a, an outer automorphism. And, and so it determines a free bicyclic group. And so in particular, there's an, for that free bicyclic group, there's an associated Alexander polynomial and an associated McMullen polynomial. So this is just the situation where you have those two polynomials. Um, and just for the purposes of writing down a formula, assume the rank is at least two. So the first theorem is that when the original map was orientable, just like in McMullen's case and Parallax generalization, we have this precise equation that relates the polynomials. The McMullen polynomial is equal to the Alexander polynomial times this vertex polynomial, which it's not so important what the vertex polynomial is, it's this one thing we define. Okay. Um, so that's the relationship when F is orientable, sort of the out of n analog of McMullen's and then Parallax work. So if, if the map is not orientable, it's not true. They don't have to be the same, but they're always, that formula always holds mod two. Okay. Um, where mod two means I take coefficients in Z mod two. I look at these are polynomials in the group ring Z mod two, um, bracket H. And then, okay, and then there's the course, there's a corresponding formula in the rank one case as well. Cool. Um, so one can think of this as answering like question three. It's giving some partial answer to question, or answering question three, what's the relationship between the polynomial that determines the stretch factors and the polynomial that determines the algebraic stretch factors, the homological stretch factors. Okay, we could say a little bit more. And maybe the little bit more we could say is maybe the most interesting part. So, but to say that bit more, I need to say a little bit more about what the DKL prove. So what is their cone, right? They have this cone in homology. They prove that for every primitive integral element of their cone, we, all, we have the following data. You know, we always fix something and then look at the data that comes with it. So they build this folded mapping torus because for every primitive integral element of the cone, they build a dual cross section to the flow. And by dual cross section, it's a graph um, embedded in the folded mapping torus that has a first return map by using the semi flow. It just, it's like a different splitting um, of the free bicyclic group, just like in the case of uh, Thurston's cone. <sighs> okay, so I'm saying that now. So the class uh, C determines a splitting of gamma as an ascending H in an extension with some monodromy phi. 
And moreover, the stretch factor of this return map to the graph, this F, is equal to the stretch factor of this um, uh, injective homomorphism phi. Um, and also, it's equal to the largest root of the McMullen polynomial at the specialization. So, this is just me summarizing their theorem that the largest root of the McMullen polynomial at the specialization using the specialization determines for you the stretch factor of this first return graph map. So if none of this is, you know, this is doing this too quickly, but you understand the situation of the Thurston cone, it's just the, the they prove the, they establish the analogous results for their cone. Okay, so let's just like add to the theorem from before. So suppose you have these, this primitive train track map and you build the folded mapping torus and you get the associated free bicyclic group. Um, so first, if one, you know, one, if the map you use to build your free bicyclic group or really any integral class in that cone uh, has an orientable monodromy, then every class, every primitive integral class in that cone has an orientable monodromy. And in particular, the two stretch factor functions agree over the whole cone. Okay, so this answers our second question. If, if the map you start with is orientable, then the stretch factor functions agree over the whole cone. Okay. Now remember, if the stretch factor functions agree at a single point, that means at that point, you either have something orientable, in which case the first bullet point says you agree over the whole cone, or it could be the stretch factor functions agree at a single point. It could mean you're in the anti-orientable case. The monodromy is anti-orientable. And in that case, something very different happens. If you build your mapping torus with an anti-orientable map, and then you look at anything else that's a primitive integral class in the cone, then the stretch factor and the homological stretch factor agree at that different class if and only if the class C and the original dual class agree mod two. So this is to say, like you look at your cone, and if you build your mapping torus with an anti-orientable uh, map, you look at your cone, you have you know, infinitely many of these primitive integral classes. The classes for which the stretch factor, where the stretch factors agree, is exactly a single residue class mod two. Um, and it's exactly at those classes where you have an anti-orientable monotron. So this is like maybe a subtle answer to that second question about if you start with something where the you build your free bicyclic group using a, um, an automorphism where the stretch factors agree, then do they agree for nearby cohomology classes? And the answer is it depends whether you use something orientable or anti-orientable. And if it was anti-orientable, it's a residue class mod two. Uh, so sorry, so regarding this uh, point, now, uh, uh, part two, so uh, can both of these things happen, you know, with different C, uh, you know, so in the same uh, column? No, so if one of the classes is orientable, then everything in the class is orientable. So if one of the classes is anti-orientable, then the anti-orientable classes are exactly a single residue class mod two. Uh, well, let me try again. Uh, <laughs> unparse what's written here. Yeah. Uh, 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 the, the, the two cases are mutually exclusive, one and two. Ah, uh, so one of them is just that uh, 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 FC is anti oriented. Uh, I see. Huh. Okay. Yeah. So it's saying, like, you know, okay, when, when you start with something anti orientable, then you could say whether another class, or another class corresponds to a different splitting and hence a different, um, if it's a nearby splitting, a different outer automorphism. And you could ask whether that's anti orientable or not. And the question depends on the class you chose. What well, what did it, did it equal the original class mod two? Okay. And really, the second point comes from a more refined statement that in the anti-orientable class, there's a related formula that relates the polynomials, um, where something kind of mysterious happens, where the formulas are the formula still holds as in the orientable case, except you have to put minus signs in some places that captures the way that edges get um, reversed under the monodromy. 
Okay, so this is basically what I wanted to say. Maybe just quickly show you what a computation looks like. And I didn't finish. Yeah, when I was preparing this these slides, I didn't like write down. A, write uh, down. Sorry, one moment. I'm still. Uh, yeah. Can we go back to the previous slide? Uh, you know. Sure. Trying to understand what's written here. So in the second case, you know, I understand that it's disjoint from the first one. It's yeah. So suppose that f is anti-orientable. Then yeah. there are these equivalences, right? You know. Yes. That, uh, uh, but uh, is it still possible that for some c in the cone, uh, uh, you know, one of the things happens, uh, and for uh, that, that, that there will be some c for which uh, uh, f c is uh, uh, anti-orientable, and some others for which it's not. Yeah, yeah, where it is and where it is not is a single residue class mod two. So eta, eta, like in that last item of the arrows, eta is a fixed cohomology class. Oh, so uh, mod two, it's a fixed uh, thing. Oh, I, I see. So basically, it's um, like, uh, uh, oh, I, I see. So it's anti orientable just in one place, so to speak. Uh, uh, one place mod two, which is one of course, place, one just place infinitely mod. many things. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's yeah. one place mod yeah. two, and in other places it will be, uh, it will be oriented. Yeah. Yeah. There could be like thirty maps to Z mod two, and so for one thirtieth of the com of the cohomology classes, it's anti orientable. It's pretty strange. Okay. Yeah, it's strange. I mean, the the, the proof explains why, but yeah, the state. I, Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. We could see an example. So there's like three minutes, two minutes left. Let me just show you what goes into doing an example. Um, so this is the same example as before. Okay, so now I'm calling this map phi. So there's the free bicyclic group. Um, so the homology mod torsion is generated by two elements. I'm calling them alpha and u. And u is going to be the element that maps to minus one under the dual homomorphism. So you might say, why did I choose minus one instead of one? There's a good reason for it, but. So that's what the associated cover looks like. So that's the cover of the original graph um, that corresponds to the universal free abelian cover. And the labels are just how the deck transformation acts, okay? So then what you do is you lift the action of F to this cover and you write down the matrices that record the action on one chains and zero chains. So the next slide, you're gonna see two matrices. That's gonna be the matrices that record the action on one chains and zero chains. Here they are. Um, so you see these are um, matrices with coefficients in um, the deck group of the previous slide, which is generated by single element alpha. Okay. And now you can compute using the determinant formulas what the um, Alexander polynomial looks like. So the Alexander polynomial is just a ratio of determinants. So that's something easy once you put into a computer. And there it is, that's the Alexander polynomial. Um, this is an anti, remember, this is an anti orientable um, outer automorphism. So there's a formula to compute the McMullen polynomial using the anti orientableness. So if you, if you just look at it, the, there's the, um, the first place where I wrote down a formula for the Alexander polynomial. You see the numerator. The numerator is essentially the McMullen polynomial where every term where you see an odd exponent on the U, we put a minus sign in front of it. So there's a specific reason for that. But you'll see that's the McMullen polynomial. Um, anyway, just to show you a picture, here's what the McMullen polynomial, the cone, that cone C sub M looks like in this example. Um, and so just to remind you, I said like earlier on, I said, this is an example where the stretch factors all agree, but it's not geometric. So here's just a proof that it's not geometric. If it were geometric, it would come from a surface homeomorphism. And so the mapping torus would be a three manifold. And if you have a three manifold, it's Alexander polynomial has extra symmetry. Um, fact, Alexander polynomial of a three manifold is invariant up to replacing the entries with their reciprocal. Okay, but you just do the computation. This, this Alexander polynomial is not invariant to replacing the entries with their uh, inverses. And so it's not a three manifold. And so the map's not geometric. Um, okay, so that's all I wanted to say. If, if like 
you were to do more calculations, you could kind of try to understand Ilya's question. This is an anti-orientable case. You could understand the residue class mod two that we were describing and see in this case, um, you know, which are the primitive integral points that are exactly which primitive integral points correspond to anti-orientable monodromies. That is exactly the classes where the stretch factor and the homological stretch factor agree. And for every other primitive integral class, they do not agree. But that's it. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Sam. Okay. Thank you, Sam, for a very interesting talk. Uh, so, are there any questions that haven't been asked yet? Uh, so, uh, about this last example, that uh, uh, can you show it again? Uh, you know, uh, so in this example, uh, I take it. No, uh, I mean, I don't know what you want to say. Yeah. Uh, uh, so where the stretch factors are sort of all, all the same, you know, uh, but, but somehow, uh, I mean, the, the next slide that, that we have, right? Um, um, and then there were equalities. Uh, uh, so what do you oh. think? Uh, um, so I take it, neither uh, fino, uh, I mean, neither uh, fino uh, phi inverse is parageometric here. So all of the trees here are presumably non geometric, right? You know, in terms of index properties. Uh, or, or in, in, the, in this example, I believe all the trees are non geometric. This is uh -huh. this is an a geometric. Uh -huh. Both phi and its inverse are a geometric here. Yeah, so phi, or, and the phi inverse are a geometric. Yeah. One can also do non geometric. One can also do power geometric examples, which we have done. Um, Interesting. Uh, yeah, so, for index reasons, you could say things like this is, you, for index reasons, you could say things like here is an outer automorphism that is orientable but cannot re be realized as like a positive map on a rose. Things like that, right? Because you could construct a orientable example with interesting singularity information. Or something. Oh, for instance, the square of this map. I believe the square of this map cannot be realized as a positive map on a row. So, just like, I, was it Joseph's question? The square of this map is orientable, but I'm pretty sure it can't be realized as a train track map on a row, or it can't be realized as a positive automorphism because of the singularity information. Think about that a little bit more. Uh, and uh, um, this, uh, what did you call it? Uh, uh, the, 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 the other factor, the difference between the uh, Alexander polynomial. Uh, uh, what, what was it called? Oh, they called it the vertex polynomial. Oh, the would, vertex polynomial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it depended on what again? Uh, on the cycles, on the periodic orbit that come uh, that pass through vertices. That's so right. That's, that's right. Find it. Uh, so presumably, then you also have a precise understanding how it changes under subdivisions and also under changes of the sort of. Um, uh, time uh, structure because occasionally it can happen that you can define the graph structure or, or, or on the graph uh, um, in a kind of unexpected way. There could be a periodic orbit which doesn't. Uh, um, well, what, it, what it's doing is it's exactly canceling out the ambiguities in your definition because the Alexander polynomial is an invariant of the, I mean, at least in the orientable case, the Alexander polynomial is an invariant of the group, not depending on anything. The vertex polynomial depends on the folded mapping torus in precisely the same way that the McMullen polynomial depends on the folded mapping torus. Oh, I see. And at least in the anti-orientable case, it's exactly canceling the superfluous stuff. Yeah. Interesting. OK. Very good. Uh, and uh, the very first thing that you showed, uh, I mean, uh, is it hard or is it relatively straightforward to, to prove that if um, it, that in the non-orientable case for a single automorphism, uh, yeah. uh, uh, that, that, that uh, the stage factor drops, the homological stage factor drops? Homological stage factor effect. Is it some kind of basic Perron-Fabenio theory comparing the matrices? Uh, you know, you, or you're, a, you're asking how hard my theorem is. Is that a yes? Is that a nice thing to ask? <laughs> uh, uh, Maybe I should have waited. No, you no, know. no. Yeah, I mean. It's it's not it's not straight parent for Venus theory because okay. you know because the because the uh, map on cycles is not 
a necessarily a positive map. So it's not like comparing two parent or Venus matrices. It's uh -huh. not, I mean, it's not like, you know, it's, it's the tools we're familiar with. So it's, I'm not going to say it's like, mm -hmm. that's what I'll say. I mean, it's the tools you're familiar with that, that are used. Yeah. Uh, oh, plus a branch cover trick. I think the new idea is like to develop something that is similar to a branch cover of a graph where the graph map lifts to a orientable graph map. So I think there's, there's an idea there that mimics the behavior of branch covers for surfaces. Okay, and yeah. then, you use, then you use standard parent for tricks on that cover. That's maybe mm -hmm. the way of saying it. Okay, very good. All right, are there any other questions? Okay, let us thank some again. Thank you. Stop the recording. Uh,